Hi, uh, my name is Nitin. Uh, I currently manage the um, content optimization engine in Yahoo. So we've been working with Hadoop uh, for quite a long time now, and we have gone through different phases and have used to employ different open source, te open source technologies. So I'm going to talk about can you hear me? Is it fine? Go ahead, speak up now. Okay. Okay, so you want the introduction again, or? Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about a few things that we have done at Yahoo. I mean, I personally in this optimization team. So overall, you keep hearing Carol talking about a few good things on the front page that we have been doing. So essentially, when she talks about at the scale, um, she indirectly is referring to the team within Yahoo. That's us. So just wanted to highlight that point in the beginning of it. Um, so what do we do generally here? So we have been completely focused mainly on delivering the right content to the right user at the right time. Uh, when we talk about all these, there are different dimensions on which we would be looking at optimizing it. And the scale that we talk about is at Yahoo's level to do this. And also, we try to keep Carol Barts excited so, so that she can mention us whenever she thinks right. So when you talk about relevance at Yahoo, right? So it has evolved over a period of time. So since we started four years back, before that, most of the content on Yahoo was generally controlled by editorial inputs, it's like what needs to be shown, how it needs to be shown. Most of that was driven by a set of editors doing that. Uh, in fact, they cannot um, make sure that every individual who comes to Yahoo is given the right content. It's not possible at all to look at how 50 million users are doing it, uh, or more than that. So. We added a level of looking at the crowdsourcing, figuring out what, what people like. So when you look at what pe when you ask a question, what people like, that itself is huge. I and mean, then in terms of the amount of data that we need to collect and how we need to crunch them, how we need to build models, it gets up to a very high scale. Now, not only that, when you talk about this, there are different kinds of models or like optimization techniques that need to be employed. Um, and you, you need to be able to process this much faster because when you talk about content, a story could be like Matthew Jackson was admitted to a hospital and five minutes later he died. That was the news, that's the pattern how it came along. So if, if you are not right and not able to optimize the content correctly and taking the source of data which is very huge, you might make mistakes. I mean, you might show he's dead first and then show he's went to hospital if you don't do it right. right? Um, then basically the next generations are coming in where you look at how you want to personalize it for you. Like for example, what beer you like, does he like, what beer you like, what, what are the things that you like. So getting to that level and figuring out content and that uh, optimization at that level is what we have been um, looking at. So now when you talk about at this level, um, there are a few items that we would be able to recommend. And when you talk about at this end, it's like millions of items that we would be looking at and being able to get signals on it, build models and uh, show them to the right user at the right time. Now, okay. so, so generally when you talk about ranking problems, right? so we have a couple of ranking problems, generally, overall. Right? There are more when you, when you talk to researchers, but ultimately it boils down to a couple of few things. So figuring out what is the most popular thing on the web. So now, most popular with the history of the user now, when you look at a few set of users, it's very easy. But when you talk about like hundreds of thousands of users, it gets big. When you talk about millions of users, it gets very big. Now, storing all these user information and figuring out what needs to be shown next when he comes to the site is a very uh, huge problem. So, like personalization, we look at different attributes, segmentations, locations, those type of things to figure out where the content needs to be shown or what content needs to be shown. Um, then, like I've talked about deeper personalization, where you look at what you like. It's, it's, it, it's nothing like Homeland Security or anything like that. It's just figuring out the basic things that you do on that and figuring out what content basically you would be interested in when you come to the site. So the next is, like there are other related affinity stuff, right? So people who did this, how this is like similar to Amazon's setting. Uh, Essentially, where I'm getting to this is the scale first, and then we'll talk about how we have built this thing on the Hadoop and other stuff. 
Um, so as part of this, I mean, the ability, so when you talk about all these optimizations and all these things, it's a very complex system. And we need to be able to figure out if there is, if you want to make continuous improvements to your system, you need to have channels with which you can analyze them very easily. You need to make it very easy to users to figure out what's happening wrong in, the ter in terms of how we are building models and all those things. So we have something like a reporting dashboard which essentially tells it. And there is a cluster which allows us to do all this analysis pretty fast. Then there are other business optimizations. They could be, I, I can't tell most of the like, those dollar things, but essentially some kind of voice metrics that generally we are worried about. Um, so now the general flow of the whole optimization process is we have a bunch of content that comes in. It gets into the optimization engine. Right now it's a big black box. So you could be doing, this could be Hadoop or this could be anything, HBase or whatever. So we basically look at, we basically split the traffic into a small percentage and figure out, okay, okay I get a new story, I need to figure out whether how the story is behaving for you. So we explore it on a small percentage, get a real-time feedback, and then exploit it on the rest 99% of the traffic, essentially telling you, hey, these are the this, this are the sample sizes telling these are the good stories, then this is how we should be showing it to the rest of the world. Now when we're doing this, again, you get the insights, and this is, this is the production insight that you can get. Um, but now if you look at the overall structure of the problem. So essentially we are capturing user events that are happening, whatever. Uh, they could be coming, they are flowing in real time into the system. Uh, then we are basically looking at merging with the item metadata that we have or that we can acquire uh, in real time. Then connecting it with the feature generation service and out comes two different kinds of models. One is the item model which tells how the item is behaving for these different segments. Right? So where I'm getting to this by showing you um, these slides is the scale. When I talk about millions of items, you can imagine you have millions, millions of these rows and you can look at any number of features on those items. Those could be hundreds of thousands of them. Right? Now you need to update these as fast as you can because if you can't, you're not able to determine when, when the story is really uh, going up or going down. You will not be able to determine it. Now, when you talk in terms of users, users are essentially also, you have, when you talk about depersonalization, users are also a lot of them, right? I mean, just imagine, just the people in this room and you're storing a few information about, I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of information that you always need to keep manipulating. <coughs> so, essentially, these need to be, I mean, if you look at the latency at which we have to do, um, so, we don't call it real-time optimization because nothing can be done real-time optimization is our belief, but there are possible ways of doing it. But we call it online because there is some amount of um, time lag between which we do this. And generally it's around five minutes for the item and we can update users. We update generally users around five to 30 minutes. Um, so your behavior gets reflected at, the, at that rate. Now, going to the next step. So these are like different kinds of uh, models that we generally look at building. So these, these, what the things that you look here can be represented as matrices. So you have a user, like I have showed in the previous slide, you have a user and you have a bunch of content features like, you like sports, you like finance, you like these kinds of things. Now when you have items and users, so you can say this item is liked by users of this age or male likes sports or females like entertainment, those kinds of things. Uh, users and content, they are essentially basically allowing us to do priors. Then you can have capability to compare users to users because that's clustering, that clustering allows you to figure out what what other users are doing and how you are related to other users and essentially being able to use that cluster information to target content to them. Uh, one note, we don't target the ads, so you should not be worried. So you'll get better content, not ads from my, uh, my team. So then item item clustering is basically figuring out how items are related to each other. So it's some kind of graph that we need to build on top of it. So now going to the next slide. So the scale I just talked about. So we receive billions of events per second into our system. So it's huge amount of data that flows through. I mean, it's, when it flows through, we should be able to hold it, analyze it, and update all these things, and ship it out. Now, only thing that comes to my mind is Hadoop stack. Nothing else right now I know that can do at that scale other than which is an open source community to do that. So, and we also process huge amounts of data, so like the same things and tens of thousands of features. So, 
going to the stack, so I can, I can talk a little bit more about on this. So this is a very high level view. I would say this is around 20,000 to 30,000 level view of what that is. But uh, if you want any more details, I can put it down. Uh, so generally, what we employ, I mean, one thing I wanted to uh, tell you about all the data that we collect. So from the data collection gets into uh, on, onto the DFS. Um, and essentially, we have edge base on top of it for most of our results that we generate. Like all our item models are stored in edge base. All our user models are stored in edge base. And, and in edge base also allows us to ingest any, any direct or streaming data into it. Like any content updates that are happening anywhere from anywhere else are being fed into edge base directly. Now, and also, what we have essentially done is, when you talk about modeling, like I was saying, there is always a need for us to be able to analyze this data as fast as we can. Because if there is a problem that's happening, we need to be able to look at it now. Because in retrospective, you might not have all the variables that were present at that time. Right? So you need some kind of a system to basically connect all these things together. So mainly we use analytics. For analytics, we use Hive. And I can talk to you about, about why we do that. Um, one other important thing that I want to highlight here is there are, there are, so you look at edge services. I'm going to talk more about what we did with edge These are essentially not your uh, Apache or YTS layers that are edge services. This is, this is what we call it as grid edge services. And there are certain things which we cannot gridify or we cannot make them run on the grid and maintain the characteristics of uh, our running job. So we basically essentially take those out and keep it closer on the edges of the grid that we maintain, so allowing us to be, I mean, basically making us easy to access and being able to, able to easy to manage those. Um, then we have a grid workflows. So we have been using our own homegrown, but there's plan to migrate to use Lucy, which was released, I think, last uh, during Hadoop uh, Summit, right? Um, and there are a bunch of tools. So one thing you, you guys might be saying, OK, you guys use HBase, but you don't use it for serving. We don't use it for serving. So all we are mainly looking at it for is being able to allow point lookups and support multidimensional data on the grid right now. And uh, all the stuff that is done on the serving is done by peanuts. You guys might have, you guys have, have heard about this project. Uh, it's basically an online source, uh, key values, task replication, and all those things. So we essentially take the data from whatever we generate on the grid and basically ship it. So now the question comes, do we do this every five minutes? Yes, we do this every five minutes. So whatever gets updated, whatever things got updated, we basically ship it to the front end store so that we can use them in real time for ranking. So, yeah. so, do you have two Hadoop clusters? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so the way it is set up is basically um, you have you have a one Hadoop cluster actually, but there is another one where you can do another other kind of analysis. But like for from a production standpoint, you can imagine that. Like, so some time of other analysis, it's a small other cluster that we set up for analytics, but they basically replicate the data and they have the same concept. And the sources are click events and do click what? Is that what is your streaming sources? Yes, so essentially you look at what a user did. So those events pretty much flow in. Are you doing any joints between two Yes, we do have a lot of joints. So I'll get, I'll get to that. Um, going to the next slide. So, so on top of this, so now you guys looked at, OK, we have HP. Uh, we have uh, Hadoop. We have all these things. Now the problem comes, we need to be having a framework where we can build and build any kind of model that like science can think of. Now when I say any, uh, I would say any, but it is still a very limited set. There are still constraints that we have to go above and beyond to sort of solve them. Right now. Using HBase has allowed us to solve most of the problems that we face generally in modeling because it provides a global state um, for us. Um, so our modeling framework, basically, I wouldn't put HBase, but I just wanted to highlight that the global state is maintained in HBase when we want to. That's very important for us. Um, it's basically a collection of big UDFs, and we basically use uh, flow of modeling, but the stages are assembled in the pit. Right, so you guys know what that big, what big is. Um, so essentially, there are different stages that you have, in, have to build in modeling. So 
you basically can customize each stage using PQDFs, but you stitch the whole, all the whole pipeline of how the processing or modeling of data needs to flow using PIC. Right? Um, now, so things like online logistic regression, things like clustering, things like affinity, things like regression models, decompositions, right? So when you talk about decompositions, these are like matrix decompositions that require a very different kind of approach. I mean, if you try doing, we tried doing it in a simple map reduce, it gets very difficult. Uh, if you guys have aware of Hama, of Hamas, uh, it's an open source project that basically builds um, matrix operations on HBase. Uh, we basically, um, I think it's just started. So we basically looked at that and employed some of the ideas from there to be able to do some of these matrix operations that we do. And when you talk about matrix here, when you are doing decomposition, it cannot be done on one machine. It is not possible. Now you have to do it on Hadoop now. Okay, fine. But there is no communication between your mappers and reducers or there is no interprocess communications anywhere. So it's very hard to be able to build these kinds of algorithms on top of those. Um, having HBase basically allows you uh, to basically represent your matrices in the form that you have been always used to and operate on them in the form that you have always been used to. Right? So doing that, decompositions become easy. So you can do, you can have 100 million rows by, I don't know, 50,000 columns and you should be able to decompose them pretty much using this system, rather than you figuring out how can I compress them and put them on one machine or write into process communication. You can use um, table clusters to do that, but I think that's even a long shot to get that in. Then most of the modeling pipeline, basically the behavioral are changes, the behavioral changes are um, induced by configurations, like what features need to be generated. So like, I want to optimize something. What do I need to optimize it for? Is it I want to optimize it based on gender? I want to optimize it based on age and gender. I want to optimize it based on age, gender, and location. Those type of or, and there are a bunch more. Um, those are configurable and they can be controlled by configuration as what needs to be happening. Um, so and allows us to type uh, basically type allows us to perform different types of joins. Whether you can join it on a users and see how they are behaving, join it on items or features, essentially allowing us to build most of the models that we described before. Now, the input generally um, for any of this is the DFS or it can be an HBase itself, HBase table itself. And the output can be the DFS or an HBase table itself. In, in, in some cases, there are like some temporary data analytics data that you basically hold off on DFS, and your transformed or final analyzed data is what goes into and what we have built is a standard pattern for updating certain stores. It's, it's simple, right? So you have you have peanuts which looks like a table. You have edge base which looks like a table. All you need is that kind of a store. But be it on, on at the same side, be it Cassandra or be it peanuts uh, um, or be another edge base. The pattern that we use is basically we define a source table. We have the data, or a column, or a column family, whatever that is and basically transform that data into a form that we ultimately wanted. If, if you don't want any transformation, you can cook it null and basically passes it through. Uh, and basically the same, and that's what you can define, and it's just all made by configurations. The best thing that this allows us to do is, allows us to have a standard way of replicating the data, whether we replicate it to the other HBS instance or replicate it to the front-end serving, serving systems. Right? Um, so, so generally, our HBase tables have uh, HBase has these many tables. Um, so I'm going to talk about the size of the cluster a little bit. So item tables we generally store all the items, related features, store item user models. Um, we store other parameters like unique users, skip counts. These are different parameters that are needed for modeling. Um, and this table contains tens of millions of items. And this table is generally updated with the five minutes based on the data user models. Um, store user content features for, for each user. So summarize user history looking at what are the items that basically, and you need not be worried. I mean, we cannot identify a user who that exactly is. Um, it's kind of difficult when you get to that level. Uh, this, this, the user table gets added, uh, updated every five to 30 minutes. 30 minutes. So that's it's a part of it. Um, and the term model are basically for like figuring out what are the buzzing terms and things that are coming up right now based on the users that have been interacting 
uh, these are updated every five minutes, and there are millions and hundreds of lots of them. Because if you look at, you can just do every keyword that every user on Yahoo is just looking at, and if you want to keep track of those, that's basically the manifestation. Now, I described uh, the edge services in the earlier lecture. Right? So essentially, what we did was, it was coming to a point where we were not able to keep up running all these different kinds of services on the grid as part of like a distributed cache. So like if you are doing some kind of categorization, you have a huge dictionary, right? I mean, which you need to load. These are models that we need to load in order to categorize the content. Those things on every map at Reduce, we cannot keep loading them. It's totally impossible for us to keep doing them. And when you talk on the grid, we're not just running one job to do this. There are like 50, 60, 100 jobs that might come at the point which needs all of these things. So what we ended up doing is basically taking all of those things that we do and create a cluster around the grid where we can host them. Now, you need to make sure if you want performance, they have to be in the same backend. They cannot be, I mean, there are some constraints that you have to um, uh, be under to make them more, work more efficient. But you, once you place them on the edge, now you can define, uh, we basically use Avro RPC to communicate uh, between the services and the times of the services. So any map or reduce can be basically using um, uh, to talk to any of the edge services that we have. So some of the edge services that we build, uh, I mean, we use right now are for categorization, geotagging, and feature transformation. Mm -hmm. So like feature transformations are basically, you look at, when you look at a high dimensionality, right? So it's a multi-dimensional space. So you essentially look at, when you look at a hyperlink, you transform that into reduced dimensions to reduce the curse of dimensionality. So when you do that, if the research can employ SVT or some of those things. Those again are huge models. So we cannot keep them loading. So we basically put them into edge services and then use that, use the client to communicate to this, uh, either in map or reduce. So this is one way of for us to do joins, essentially, in data. But isn't it slow, like, when you have a service and then... So that, that's the thing. So your organization becomes really important. Right? Where you place these nodes. If you are in a different back and all those things, yeah, you can. Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? Oh, he said, uh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be slow if you place like that? Uh, the, the yeah, yeah. Um, so the next stage when it comes is like, okay, so, so this is just, I mean, if you guys have any questions, I, we can take it later. But uh, <coughs> essentially, we did this morning, right? Now, the problem is the hardest part of ever of doing any kind of modeling is basically figuring out what's going on, right? And right now it is very difficult to figure out what's going on. So only way we can make this happen is if we have a very easy way of be able to debug and monitor the models that we are building, right? And when you talk about these millions of items, millions of users, it gets into a state where we have to be able to have different kinds of methods to do that. Now, and sometimes we have to run complex queries. And in order to make it debugging easy, it, it, we should be able to use easy interfaces to do that. Um, generally, in some cases, uh, PMs might want to know, product managers want to know what's happening. Uh, engineers might be interested in figuring out what the system they built or the model they built or is there anything wrong. Research might be interested in a different aspect of it, like are the variances going to zero or things are stabilizing or not. Those kind of questions we need to be able to answer and get near real-time insights into those. Um, so right now on our cluster, we have tons of modeling, monitoring, and reporting queries every five minutes that we run, right? Um, essentially to figure out which models are behaving right. And in order to do this, we use high. And we, we considered uh, big also to do that, but when you talk about high seemed a very natural way of accessing the data that we had necessarily, and it, even in PMs, product managers who were capable of writing SQLs were able to get to that. So, so we have a standard interface to looking at that. So generally, if this, is, this is an interface where you can essentially come and write a Hive query and let it run for whatever time, and basically, this is, this is your view. Right? You essentially can come and write whatever you want to write in there, and then it goes to the back and runs all your 
analysis and comes back up. The results are presented in the output. Um, the logs are there and all. So now once you like it, now once you figure out, hey, this is something I need to be doing. So when we generally run some test, you run test for a week or two, right? That's how generally the tests are done on sites. So when you do that, you have figured out what is the best way to be able to monitor this. So you basically come, you tried a couple of times in here, you put some queries, you figured out, oh, this is how I can be able to figure whether things are going good or bad. Now you, you can come in here and you say promote that way that you generate. Now, this is a dev test, but you can go here and then you list all the queries that you have been running. And whenever the queries are done, the results will be posted down here. Right? So essentially allowing you, allowing you to come back and look at the results and whenever you want. And this data it generates every five minutes if you want it to be. Right? So and also other things that you can do, uh, which I have not highlighted here, is like being able to use uh, this cluster for not only just analysis, but if you want any other kind of reporting stuff, right? I mean, if you want to generate other kind of reports, this basically interface. This interface we built it because we didn't we we were getting into trouble of like like product manager comes to us and says, hey, I need this information. Then our one engineer needs to go figure out, talk to him, figure out what needs to be happening. So this basically allowed us to, you know, here is the interface, go do whatever you want. Let's don't bother us. We have other things to do, right? So this this made it very easy for us to handle that. Okay. So so right now, so just to give uh, go back in time, right? So we tried different combinations. So we started with streaming. We I think we initially did native Java and all those things, but never we were able to satisfy all the uh, modeling constraints that we had. They were never able to build all different kinds of mods that we were able to build. Um, the combination of big and edge base is so sweet that we we basically rebuilt whatever we have been thinking for around two years in about two months, essentially. Right? So it's just that how we need to stitch together and for that you need to join now. Um, made it simple to build any different kinds of science models. And HBase allowed, made it so easy for us to do point lookups on the grid. And that was the main thing that we were missing all the time. Right? When you talk about matrix decompositions and all those things, we were essentially missing those things. <laughs> when you talk about modeling, you can look at, when you look at science papers, they have a lot of matrices, always. And when you want to represent them exactly, HBase was a natural fit. I mean, it was a natural way to represent the data that was there. Now the question that comes is, there are some um, edge-based characteristics that basically uh, might not be suited for certain. And people might question whether, hey, is this the reads are not that good? I mean, if you know, the guys from peanuts are here, they will definitely question it. But for the for the is cases peanut, that is peanut is an untested. Um, who is the anyone from peanuts here? I. I am I'm not sure. Do you know? Is uh, Peanuts a Memcache DB? No. Um, so, and these are the things, right? So moving edge services out basically allowed, uh, putting things into edge services basically allowed us to scale different things and provided the whole simplicity to the whole stack. And the advanced, because these things scale very differently. Some things are memory intensive, some things are CPU intensive. Um, your map reduced jobs are very different. I mean, your IO bound, in some cases, when you are using edge base, you are also memory bound. If you are running on the same cluster, you, you have all these constraints. And you can't just put yet another thing on there and expect it to work. So, this basically provided a great, great interface for us to move it um, And Hire has been very great way for analyzing any results that we have been. So this whole stack overall has been proven to us really good in terms of for optimization of content and investigations and building different kinds of models. Cool. <coughs> That's all. So you guys have any questions? Sure. Uh, can you comment a little bit about big and edge base combination? Kind of seems a little bit odd combination for me. What kind of uh, features do you take from big and what kind of from So. Big basically allows you. Question. 
So, so he's basically asking uh, between and HPA seems like an odd combination, and he's mainly looking for like what are the characteristics of pig and what are the characteristics of HPA that basically are mainly different. Um, first thing, pig is very simple for programmers. Uh, it allows you to stitch things together, join any data or on all those things. Um, and right now it is it's much more customizable than all those things. And, and from a high level, it allows anyone to spend a day who doesn't know and being able to write that. Now, age base. Right? So if you write a program without any variables, right? So it's that kind of a hard. And edge base basically allows when you talk about modeling stuff or any matrix, those kind of stuff, right? So you can imagine you can basically say for each this row and for each that row or slice of those, and then being able to combine two lookups on edge base and figure i and j. You can put two for loops in there. So those kind of characteristics basically allowed us to do much better combination of or uh, being able to use them in modeling more effectively. Right? Do, do you use edge base? Mm -hmm. In peak, I mean, yes. Okay. So mainly for lookups, uh, point lookups that allows us to. So in space now you do processing and you want any data, I need not worry about making sure how I should be joining to make sure this data is available together. I don't need to because I have this data. Either I can map or reduce. I can just find that thing. And generally, we can do matrix operations which are demoed. Is it running on the same HDFS? Like the scientist runs his block or his query? Are there access the same? Yes. So how do you separate the two? I guess I mean, if the physical resources are kind of. So there are basic things, right? So for uh, this is the, this is the dev the interface that I showed you is like dev or staging. But generally, what happens is there are when they want to promote it to like a production thing, there is there is a big process that, and we make sure that this. It, it's not like you can freely run it on crash. <laughs> okay, thanks.